All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Jones Seminar today. It's a, a special pleasure to welcome Dr. Anil Kulakarni from um, the Mechanical Engineering Department at Pennsylvania State University, uh, and especially to talk about a subject that is important to Dartmouth and important to the Thayer School of Engineering, Professional Ethics and Engineering and Science. Um, so, uh, Professor Kolkarni received his BTech degree in aeronautical and mechanical engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology at Bombay and left to join the United States and to do his master's and PhD at Brown University. From there, he joined the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Pennsylvania State University and has been there for 35 years. The, the, the longest running faculty member in the department, which is. Uh, uh, it gives you certain privileges, I think. Um, his academic areas of interest are energy, materials processing, computational fluid mechanics, and professional ethics. In the energy area, he's worked in hybrid power plants for rural, rural remote areas. Uh, in materials science, he's worked on various topics, laser glazing, welding and microgravity, electron beam physical deposi vapor deposition, and field-assisted sintering technology. Um, in 2014, he was awarded a Fulbright scholarship for, by the U.S. government to go to Norway to work uh, on indoor and outdoor fugitive emissions in the materials processing industry. And there he met our own Erlen Scholson, who was also in Norway. And so uh, that's part of the reason we've been able to attract him to come here. Um, he has traveled as a U.S. scientist uh, on an information tour on regenerative energies in, in Germany. Uh, as a delegation of U.S. scientists in the area of combustible science to China, a delegation to the USSR, and as a foreign representative, foreign research specialist awardee in the Building Research Institute in Japan. So it's really uh, a pleasure and exciting to have him come here today and to talk about ethics. So please welcome him. Uh, thank you all. Uh, uh, thanks, Brian, for a generous introduction. <clears throat> and thanks to the Jones uh, Seminar organizers, sponsors, and all of you for coming here. So <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about professional ethics, and I want to keep it quite informal. I want to get you involved in here. So let us see how it goes. The, I'm going to talk about these are the topics I'll just mention. Um, some of those I'll just zip through. Some of them maybe I'll dwell longer. So what is professional ethics as opposed to personal ethics and just simple law and regulations and so on? What are the ethical issues in engineering and science? Uh, an, an example or two. And, and also we look at how big is the problem or are we trying to solve a problem that really doesn't exist or hardly exists. You know, we, we want to know that. So <clears throat> can we actually solve a problem in professional ethics? Can we use our good old engineering approach of you know, uh, using some set rules? Um, increasing awareness of, awareness of ethics among students and professionals are can ethics be actually taught and learned, as opposed to coming it naturally to us? Um, we'll talk about ethics in cultural differences. We'll see whether it is fair to judge uh, people based on our culture, people of different culture based on our culture. So, <clears throat> um, If there is time left, I will briefly talk about the basics of ethics, the basic three frameworks of ethics. And finally, we'll close it, find out what next. <clears throat> so what is professional ethics? Well, to, let me just briefly talk about ethics. Ethics has roots in family, in religion, you know, religious scriptures, traditions. Um, you know, we, we have all the time, from childhood, we are bombarded <clears throat> with certain values. You know, you shouldn't lie, cheat, steal. Do whatever. And, um, well, the reason we need ethical guidelines or ethical training 
is because we are often faced with choices. And when there is a choice, it is how we select the quote-unquote right choice is important. If, if you are standing on, on a, if you're crossing the road and a drunk driver comes at you, there is no choice, you jump you know, on the side, there is no direct ethics involved there. But when there is a choice, um, we need the ethical guidelines. And going to professional ethics then, these choices are, in, are influenced by money and power and fame and so on. So <clears throat> professional ethics goes beyond personal ethics, and it, it basically depends on what, you know, what setting you're working in, um, the companies, what the industry you're working in, even the academics and, and so on. And the generally accepted components of professional ethics are the transparency in what you do, the accountability, uh, confidentiality, uh, following the law, etc. In addition to the honesty, integrity, the, the, the standard kind of ethics things that we use in personal life. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll distinguish professional ethics from you know, just prudence, you know, doing the kind of right wise thing in a given situation for the, for the company or for, for the, uh, as a student in academics. Um, we'll differentiate between legality and regulation uh, from, from the ethics. Ethics is broader than that. And look at the guidelines too, which well, the, the ethics, in a sense, it fills the gaps between all the different things. And the guidelines can be only so many ethics kind of is, you know, um, is there all over. Um, <clears throat> so when do we know there is a problem in, in ethics? Well, when the situation smells. And all of us kind of know from inside. I, I don't have to put any exact rules down, but we know that this is not right, perhaps. We know that if, or, or if you give another test there that, do you need to keep it in, can I tell this to other people? Or am I ashamed of doing that, what I'm doing? Well, there is a problem there. Um, if I have to keep something secret, for example, for national security or whatever else, I mean, is there a good reason like that, or am, am I just doing it because I just don't want to tell others, I don't want to tell my mother what I'm doing, and that's a good you know, indication that there is an, there's an ethical problem. So, <clears throat> um, ethical issues in engineering. So we look at, okay, uh, look at an example, what, what I'm talking about, professional engineering ethics issue. So. Some of you know about this. Uh, those of you are here long enough, like I am, uh, to know what was the Ford Pinto car. But this car was introduced, ironically, on 9-11 in 1970. This Ford Motor Company came out this model of Pinto. They call it Pinto. Uh, it went into production. And then they realized that the gasoline tank inside was not placed properly, right at the center. So if there was a side hit, it could get, it could explode, it could leak and then explode. And there was a way to fix it. Basically, you could, they could design a new clamp and put the uh, gasoline tank in the right place and that would cost them maybe $11 per car. And so the question was whether to change the design, spend an extra $11 or not. They had already, the car had gone into production, it was advertised, it was, the price was advertised, everything. They couldn't change that. Whether to spend that extra $11 or keep the design the way it is, keep mum and not worry about it. So this is how the management took the decision that should we not change the design? If we don't change the design, 
they estimated based on the number of it, based on the huge data that they had, you know, how many times the cars get hit at what speed and, and so on, lateral hit. There would be 180 additional burn deaths, 180 additional injuries, 2,100 vehicles would get, get damaged, and so they found out a cost for that. So there is a, the actuary, actuarial people, they have a cost associated with death, with human life, right? And so <clears throat> they estimated maybe 200,000, this is in 1970, by the way, $200,000 per death, and so much for injury, so much for vehicle, to get them fixed. If there was a lawsuit, then that would be the cost. And they said, okay, the cost would be about $50 million. If they had to change the design, they were going to make 12 and a half million vehicles, actually 11 regular cars and or one and a half million trucks based on exactly the same, same design that was going into production. $11 per vehicle to improve the design, the cost would be $137 million. What did they do? They decided not to change the design. And it went into production, and it, it was already in production, it went into distribution, and this problem was, and it did come out, um, it was kind of find the face for the company because they didn't take the decision based on ethics or whatever it can be debated because at that time, the U.S. courts would allow cost-benefit, risk-benefit analysis and base their decisions on that and so on. I mean, the whole thing became quite, uh, there was a lot, lot of legal wrangling, but we can, we can talk about, you know, one can talk about um, whether it was whether it was ethical or not, okay. So this is a type of problem that that you know, we could face with the management was faced with the problem, change the design or don't change the design. How do you take the dec the decision? Was it only the dollar that governs it, taking decision, or there are other things to it? And obviously, you know, the ethics would be very important there. And there we we see the in the news all the time, some kind of scandals, whether it is among researchers or companies and so on, somebody quit, somebody in the government was, you know, some ethics committee um, in, uh, charged them with, with something. But the, the real question is, I mean, and what, is that how widespread is the problem in engineering, ethics-wise? Is it, are the problems so, so isolated that we don't really don't need to do anything, or the problems are, you know, are sizable statistically that we should do something about it. So if you were to look at some information, some statistics, well, a recent survey, this is um, 2011 National Business Ethics Survey, it said that almost half of the employees at work witnessed some kind of misconduct, um, more than one in five employees uh, were whistleblowers who pointed out what happened, got in trouble, and uh, <clears throat> uh, you know it's almost one in seven or eight employees uh, had a direct pressure to compromise the standards. Even though there were standards written down, they had to change them. And because of whatever reasons. So that looks like it is a pretty sizable problem to me and something that we cannot simply ignore. And so, <clears throat> um, well, we can also, that is about professional engineers. What about those who are going to be professional engineers? So if you look at the pipeline of engineering or, or of the, the, uh, the education, let's say, and uh, Look at um, look among the engineering students. Okay, <clears throat> since 1964, um, well, 1964, more than half of them admitted to cheating. By 1986, it was 82 percent. I don't know what it is now. Maybe there is just uh, there's not much room to grow there uh, for the number. Uh, this is based on AC uh, Prism magazine. And among the graduate students, that was under undergraduate, and, and that among the graduate students, a little over half of them admitted to cheating. 
and we as engineers were second only to the business people. So uh, the, the point here is that it starts pretty early. It starts in, in the college itself and then um, spills into the professional life. So what I want to do at this point okay, is show you an example. Uh, this is a video clip. I want you to watch it and listen to it carefully because I'm going to ask two questions based on that and I want your honest opinion, what you think. So let's see um, whether it works first. Okay, so I'm going to kind of uh, take it, um, skip purposely a small part. How long have you been an engineer? 35 years. I graduated from the University of Leipzig in 1962. And uh, what kind of work did you do in Germany? I was employed by the state construction agency. Any job you thought was particularly challenging? Okay, so um, this uh, Mr. Schmidt, right? He is a, I can just imagine he's a very fine engineer, foundation engineer, and this is what he did. <coughs> My first question to you, I would like a show of hands that is Mr. Gunther, I think this is a spelling mistake, uh, wrong in doing what he did, given the you know, circumstances? How many of you think he is wrong? He was wrong. What he did, what he did, I mean, he 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 did. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the same kind. <laughs> it's a good, good comment. Yeah, but he he didn't. Uh, Obviously, he didn't uh, complain or whatever, and, and you know, he just kept on doing his job. He said, the quality and control engineer should take care of it. I'm not going to stay out of the whole thing because it's not my job. Was it the right thing to do? No. Does anyone think it was okay? Because based on his, based on his um, explanation and background, you remember he came from this you know, Stasi era, and then, you know, that. Uh, the secret police and very different experience where you're not supposed to open your mouth to do your job. Anyone, uh, anyone has any opinion? He did right thing or wrong thing still? Okay, could you, it's a little louder. We should not take him into account his background. Although we, we all have backgrounds, right? I mean, uh, and we carry that baggage with us. So anyone wants to talk in on behalf of Mr. Gunther, just to take a side, or we are all against him? <laughs> anyone uh, wants to say something against him, or you just want to say anything? <laughs> Um, what should he have done? done? Yes. I think it's unlikely that it could happen you know, in, in that profession today because you get sued and then you, you wouldn't be bought. <laughs> when you design a foundation, you have to make sure the thing is built up. It's all part of the job. And Absolutely. You it's feel it's that and something happens, then you're going to get sued. So I think. Right, but I, very good. I mean, I'm, I agree 100% with you in, the, in that assessment. But do we always go by the law because we get sued? I mean, that was the, the thing. Do the laws always keep up with, with what is right and wrong? Because then why do they change? Why do the laws change? If the laws change, that means something, you know, I mean, some things what we were doing before were not correct. And today, we were wrong then, and we must be right now. Right. So, yes? I also think there's potentially missing information, because if you, if you look back to his background, you don't know if, what the consequences of speaking up might have been. In other words, in his own country, had he spoken out, might there have been consequences that we didn't know about. So they sort of instilled upon him the fact that, look, do your job, mind your own business, don't say anything. Versus, and this is a cultural thing again, to Gordon's comment, you know, we're, we're taught to, to speak up. He may not have been. And therefore, he doesn't see the ethical dilemma because his superiors have said again and again and again, you know, so. Right. You take a young engineer, they work with a much more experienced engineer, and they're taught not to do the work. So I guess I go to the point that I don't think it's as big a problem that particular situation. It's not as big a problem as it might have been in that era or somewhere. Yeah, yeah, good point. But then you know we, but the, the a good point comes out of this is that you know, the young engineers need to be told what is good and you know what is right and wrong ethically, you know, given those choices, because we're not talking about technical stuff directly. Um, <clears throat> and, and then later I'm going to... Another point I'd like to make is you're not going to survive in this business if you do things like this. It just isn't going to happen. You know how that worked out? Pardon? You know how that worked out? Yeah, with the switches. <laughs> yeah, yeah with, the, with the ignition switches, yeah. Um, Okay, so. But that may be a management decision and not an engineering decision. I have a feeling the engineer probably did what made the decision that was probably the management and the money. Right, right. But eventually, I mean, the engineering and management kind of difference gets blurred as you go, go high up. But let's, um, let's look at um, 
So let's look at the next thing here, that can we solve such problems you know, more directly using simple engineering approach? And uh, normally, what do we do? So when there is a problem at hand in society, we usually you know, deal with the problem on an individual basis. I'll give you an example. Um, when the cars started coming out, in, in good numbers, and I'm going back, way back to early 1900s. People soon discovered that if these cars were driven by drunk people, because getting drunk was there much before the cars came, and um, if the drunk people drove the cars, and it's a, it's a weapon in, in wrong hands, and so that can, that can kill. So people realized that, and they, talk about, they talked about setting up guidelines. They even made laws on why you shouldn't do that. But it was not until second half of the century that they really started enforcing the laws on drunk driving. And do you know how many people, based on the current estimate, how many people actually get caught who are legally drunk and driving, one in 300. That's all, that's how many people get caught and get convicted. So after doing all of this, that's what happens. <laughs> if we have ethical problem, what do we do? I mean, we are not at that stage yet in terms of ethics, you know, in terms of, well, we, we are pretty, uh, we have made pretty good guidelines and there are some, uh, some laws. So what I want to do right now is I want to show you another situation and then I want to see how we can resolve the, both the situations together using certain, you know, a little more engineering type of approach. You know, and I will uh, I'll explain to you in a minute. Okay, so um, 
this consulting engineer, Pete, Peter, um, <clears throat> you know, he was asked to, you know, they're always asked to maintain confidentiality, you know, be loyal to your, uh, the company that you're consulting with, customer. And maybe law something implies something else. So he is in a quandary, he has a choice. Which choice he should follow? Doesn't even have an opinion here. What should he do? Does anyone have any other opinion? Yes. I guess the way I approach it is I go to the company and tell them, you know, you got to let the state know about this. And I'll let you handle it. You know, and if they don't want to, then I'm in here obligated to go to the state. So then you're obligated to go to the state. There's too much of a risk for an engineer to know something like that. And it's just. I mean, in fact, one of the one of the canons of ethics I will show you in a minute is that you know you shall require you shall maintain confidentiality when when you have to. But then there are other canons too. So right now, at this point, does anyone have an opinion about what is to be done? If not. Uh, um, <clears throat> The question is, where should we go to help, to get help for tackling such problems, right? So especially for younger engineers, you know, they are likely, or are, if they find themselves into an ethical mess, what should they do? Should we give them, you know, should, should we as educators, I'm talking now, you know, from professor's point of view, should we do something, give them a toolbox of some sort where they will know, okay, well, if this happens, this is what I should do. At least this is where I should go for help, just like we teach them differential equations, they forget about you know, how to solve the differential equations, but when it comes, the situation comes, they know where to, which text to look up, and they do the job. So, um, so one way of tackling the problem is you go to National Society of Professional Engineers Code of Ethics um, fundamentally. So they have six canons, as I mentioned, and you know, I won't go over all these, but, um, but just let's look at, say, first few. Hold paramount the safety of the public. Safety. And then you shall perform services only in your areas of expertise. <clears throat> Um, issue public statements, again, only in an objective manner and not let your emotions get into that, and as a professional when you're doing it. And be faithful agents or trustees you know, to your, um, um, I mean, this is between employer and client relationship. If somebody knows that and gets into that situation, what are they going to think? So if we, like we have two situations, one with Mr. Gunther there, that um, he kept on saying that he performs services in the area of his competence, which is actually a canon of ethics, right? And so he kept on saying that, yeah, this is right, and this is what I did. Sure, he was right. But number one canon was safety of public is important. When that conflict occurs between two situations that have some merit. Then what do you do? Well, you go to, say this, in this particular case, we will we'll go to the Code of Ethics and see which one 
uh, prevails over the other. So this list of canons, according to NSPE, is not just six different canons, but they're hierarchical. You know, first one is more important over the second and third and so on. So if there is a conflict between one and two, you go with one. Now, same thing happens with perhaps the other situation where <coughs> should he maintain confidentiality or should he report the incidents because there may be potential public hazard there. They may not know, but I leaked for a while, long time ago perhaps, we don't know that. And so that was one, and you know, of course, it is still open. This is just for our discussion here now, but there can be a lot more legal and other implications, ethical implications. We really don't want to go into legal things here, but that's, uh, that's the idea. So the next topic, how do we increase awareness of, of the students, or can we really teach ethics? Can it be learned by the student? Can the teaching learning go on? So, so this is a, this small two studies I did several years ago, a few years ago. I was in charge of, a, um, of an undergraduate um, lab course. There were 120 students there, and there were sections of 20 each, and the lab, there was a three-hour lab held every week except for the middle week. And you know, I decided, OK, since I'm in charge there and the middle week, they don't have the lab. So I know, I knew that they were going to be free at that time. So before the course started, I decided, OK, I'm going to add this extra lab or workshop on ethics. And I conducted this um, you know, two and a half hour long workshop for them. Uh, there's another very similar uh, study I did with, with business students uh, that was in India. That was in 2006. And what it involved was that I, I first had some learning modules ready. I conducted a survey before and after I presented the ethics workshop, several weeks before and several weeks after. There was a, I, I mean, I, I just didn't do it myself. We did it. My, uh, my colleague was an education specialist, um, in, and so he kind of made sure that you do the surveys, you write the surveys in a nice, nice way, you make sense out of it, and so on. So we did this together, and we analyzed the, the results. Uh, we sent for statistical analysis, chi-square distribution, and so on. And each of the modules included several little blips on, on ethics, starting from the basics of ethics. We had case studies, video clips, code of ethics. Then there is a nine-point guideline that I went over and how do you actually look at a particular problem um, and, uh, and so on. There is a quiz, et cetera. And then, of course, I had taken survey weeks before and weeks later, I did the survey. And it's presented here. There were seven questions that are, are given here. Uh, for each question, there is a post-test and pre-test um, response of the students. Higher the response, that means they're more ethically aware or, or right or whatever, you know, more ethics-wise. Um, <clears throat> and basically, we, you will notice that for questions like, do you understand why ethics is important to me and, as an engineer? And, can you write definition of engineering ethics? And can you give an example of that? Can you explain uh, something? Or given an ethical situation, can you apply this nine-point guideline to come to a resolution, come to a solution, and so on? Uh, basically, only in one case, uh, it, was all, it was almost the same, uh, where it said that engineers rarely encounter ethical problems in their work. So um, our conclusion was that, <clears throat> that we saw clear improvement, statistically significant improvement, in three areas where they could explain at least one basic ethical framework. Um, they could apply different frameworks for a situation and for a given kind of case study, hypothetical often, and uh, apply the code of ethics 
to analyze uh, a problem. There was a little less than this previous one, but there was statistically significant improvement was noted in three other areas. And like I said, one area, it was kind of relatively flat. Um, so basically our conclusion was that to the question that can we teach and learn ethics? Well, it can be taught and ethics can be learned in a very limited way, obviously, here. And they can actually learn ethics at all three levels of learning, so to speak. One is the knowledge level where they can write definitions. Uh, they can do it at comprehension level where they can actually explain what is ethical and not ethical and they can apply their knowledge to new situations and try to find a problem. Different levels of, of knowledge and they, they could do uh, some of this thing. And, and I don't want to, I mean, I, there's no way I, I want to blame the students for everything. In fact, many times students have taken initiative to tell the, the school to teach us, to teach them ethics or, or you know, because they're, they're watching all these things, they're very smart students in, in the, these are in, in, uh, in actually the, it was done in very good schools, Northwestern and, and some other schools and students were interested, wanted to have more emphasis on ethics. So anyway, so we'll move on to the next topic here. Um, ethics and cultural differences. <clears throat> a little bit of statistics right in the beginning. They, were, um, they surveyed several CEOs uh, who had joint ventures, international joint ventures, and 44% of them said that the ventures were, were very successful. This is a few years old. And the biggest cause of concern or failure, they said, was cultural difference or one of the biggest causes. 49% of the cities, almost half of them said that cultural difference was a problem. Because of that, our venture you know, was not successful. So what does do cultural difference do to ethics? Well, even though the moral values seem to be the same, I mean, they did fairly extensive study on, um, they, they asked many different types of, within many different cultures and different types of people, they asked what are the basic values, human values. And most of them came up with love, respect, um, hard work, you know, and, and some of those. Pretty much everyone understands, seemed to understand that, and yet there is a difference between how we behave when we become adults, right? I mean, that's why there are so many conflicts in the world. And so <clears throat> it is obvious that pretty much all of us, in my opinion, carry this baggage of bias, and I, which is culturally dependent. In that first video that we saw, that was a cultural bias, obviously, that he was carrying. Of course, some of us carry it less, some of us carry it more, but that is what it is. And so what I want to do here is quickly give you a quiz. Now, this is a quiz I'm going to give you, all of you. You have to answer the questions. That I'm going to give you three questions. Oops. So um, I don't know whether they have a real license for this software, but. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to close it. And uh, so this is a traveler. Who travels every year, sent home a letter. Um, and, the, and the letter goes like this Last summer I visited the land of uh, Asu tribe. The tribal community was very nice and hospitable, and some of their ways of life were quite interesting. Just like we used horses for transportation in old days, they ride racks. A rack is a faster, bigger, uh, a rack is faster, bigger, and carries more load and is more easily controllable than a horse. Often it is considered prestigious to own a precious rag or even a big flock of rags. And formal costumes of the people are quite notable. Men wear toys and trees and women adorn themselves with colorful tricks and fracks. And children and adults are often fascinated by a popular toy uh, called a retupmak. 
and love to play the game of 10 retinue. Okay, those who know the answer, don't say anything. I'm just going to ask you now questions. No discussion right now. And um, <clears throat> so let us just say that the Asu tribe exists. Okay. And, and if so, how many of you think uh, where it is located on? I mean, or what do you think about how where it lo it's located on? Uh, you can show me, you know, by show of hands, Will. Uh, do you think it's Africa? Nobody thinks it's Africa, obviously. OK, yeah. because not raising a hand is also a deliberate action, remember. <laughs> Unless you, know, don't, you don't want to be put on uh, spot. Um, Asia, Australia, um, Europe, Antarctica, North America. Yes, I see some <laughs> hands there. And South America, OK. Given the only information that we have. So how advanced is the ASU society compared to um, that of the US? How many of you think they're more advanced than us in the US? How many of you think they are about the same? How many of you think they're not as advanced as us? Some of you. OK. So, and this is the last question is almost giving away the answer, that if, if this tribe, let's say, exists, and the name Hussein includes, is, in, you know, is part of the name in, in, in the here, do you still stick to your old answer? I don't want a, uh, uh, what would be the whole answer? So I suppose some of you know the, name the, know the name of the Asu tribe chief, and that is? That is correct, Barack Hussein Obama. And that is because, see, this writer was a slightly dyslexic. Okay, I mean, you cannot really help uh, the, the guy. Nice guy. <laughs> so he wrote that, I visited the land of USA. And just like we use horses for transportation, they use cars. And a car is, is faster, bigger, carries more load, etc., than a horse, and it is considered prestigious to own a nice, precious car, BMW. And uh, there were suits and shirt and skirt and scarf. And the kids like the computer. And they like to go on the internet. It tended at me, right? So my point is that you know, all of us have this um, something in our mind where when we see this you know, somewhat foreign words or something, we make up our mind whether they are more advanced, they're less advanced, or whatever, just, just the words. Otherwise, it pretty much fits the description to us, right? As, uh, so, so, about cultural differences what is what we're talking about. I just want to show you one more uh, clip, if there is time, just a few minutes. Um, and this is about academic dishonesty, a three or four minute long clip. Does anyone know what university is this? The Duke University. Duke.
Okay, well, <coughs> so the question is, is it wrong to borrow material from another source? Of course, it's not wrong if you credit it to the right person, but without crediting, let's say, doing that. And I mean, what struck me in this video is if it is okay there, why is it not okay here? Who decides? That type of thing. So, um, plagiarism. Um, I understand there is kind of a nice honor code here, and, and you know the the Dartmouth uh, community is very proud of it. It is really nice to see that here. But <clears throat> how wrong is plagiarism? You know that uh, obviously, I mean plagiarism is wrong. It's not wrong. But if you if you look at, you know, from, from one of the students' answers, is that, you know, we, we, we used to often do that, but so do we do in other, you know, other aspects of our life. For example, when you're cooking something and you got the recipe from somewhere on, on TV or your grandma or something, I and mean, you're not always going to attribute to, you know, you're not always going to say that this person gave me the recipe. And for that matter, every word in the language, the numbers, pretty much everything we do, 99.9% .9 or more, is borrowed from somewhere because that is what we call civilization, right? The question is, and, and we don't actually give credit. 
to these things. I'm not suggesting that plagiarism is, is right, but does anyone have a strong opinion on this one? What, uh, I mean, in, especially for the second question, if it is okay there, why isn't it okay here? And who are we to judge others based on our values? Any comment? Oh, I have a story strong position on that question. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Yes? I think it's, and I think the difference between that and your example of a recipe is that academia is, is a place where ideas are a currency. And you're copying someone else's ideas, whether it's word for word or whether you're, you're taking, for instance, a methodology that they've developed and not crediting it to them. So which one, are, I mean, borrowing somebody's idea versus borrowing you know, somebody's words. You know. Which one is more serious? And, and remember, we borrow other ideas too quite a bit. When I solve a differential equation, first order differential equation, somebody has done it. I don't know who did it. But you know, I mean, I learned it, I do it, I don't attribute that you know, the, my skill or, or of, of solving this first order differential equation to the one who solved it first time. It's borrowing the idea. So is borrowing idea not as serious of an offense? Anyone? Right, right. The, certain things we accept as common knowledge, but then sometimes things get blurred because you don't know where the common knowledge stops and the ownership begins. And, um, I mean, and so at, at, at least Penn State, where I come from, on, on the first day of classes, we, are, we, we had to give a syllabus to students and we had to state our cheating policy and we had to state even what is the penalty for that. So if you are found, found you know, borrowing somebody else's work, then, I mean, my standard policy has been that first offense, you get a zero in the assignment in, in question there. So that assignment, you get zero, and you get kind of you know, reprimanded. Second time you do that, you finished with the course, and you're told to the authority you know, you, that this is what happened. But uh, again, something to think about. Um, so, you know, our perce perception of others obviously depends on our cultural bias. And I found this very nice quote uh, by Dalai Lama that how we look at others in a different way and so on. Uh, I'm almost out of. I mean, I'm out of time. So. I will not go so much over into uh, frameworks, the three frameworks I was going to talk about, consequentialism, uh, consequence-based theory, uh, deontological theory, you know, you have certain rules, virtue-based thinking. These are really the basics of ethics. You know, and then you build your professional ethics on this. And so finally, I will close it with this thought. Um, First of all, I mean, I really believe that ethics can be taught and learned to some extent. I mean, I'm, I'm not claiming that it's going to be 100 percent. As long as if I make a difference to few percent sitting in my class, I mean, that's good enough for me. And the reason we do that is when our students become professionals, they should learn to expect what can be unethical practice. So they should not get into that because this is unethical, this is not. I should not get into that. And if they were to find themselves in unethical mess, 
they should know where to, to look for, um, for the solution, for the resources for the solution. And so that's, um, and of course the hope is that we do this now in our classes and a generation later, you know, these people will become politicians, leaders, you know, uh, CEOs of companies, chief engineers, and they will put some things in there and make the world a little better. So it's a interesting quote, um, um, says, uh, developing this process of teaching and learning ethics is at best difficult, but not to do so risks moral and technological bankruptcy and prevents engineers from exercising their talents in ways that will benefit all of us. So I'll stop at this point. Good point, actually. Uh, I don't know how many of you use the software Turnitin. I'm sure some of you do that. Turnitin is a single word. And, um, and basically, we have, we have full access to that. And what it does is that whenever a student turns in any work, you know, any sentences, it checks with something like 10 billion other known kind of uh, uh, through websites, known works. and it, it gives you very nicely how many things were borrowed directly and what percent and so on. It doesn't tell you what to do after that. It's up to us and you know, what to do. And it's an interesting uh, software. And yeah, I mean, I would highly recommend anyone to use it. Uh, yes. But any other comment? So I'm really happy about uh, the way interaction went. I am, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, listening to me for this long. Thank you.